CML, of course, stores lab data and lets you share lab data with others and lets you pull in lab data that others have shared with you. The processes are sometimes obvious, but sometimes there's actually some surprising caveats. In this video, I'll walk through all of that and make sure you know about those issues that could crop up. Let's jump in. In this video, it's really three parts with a topic and a demo, topic, demo, topic, demo. To start, we'll talk about storing files, particularly device configurations, for labs that remain forever within your instance of CML. Then in the middle, we'll talk about importing a file that someone else has posted on their website, and there's a lab exercise like at mysearchskills.com site, and you want to import that and use that file as a starting point for a lab exercise. And then at the last part, we'll talk about taking a lab that's in your instance of CML and extracting that as one file that you can share with the world to help them do some lab exercise. It's that third part where most of the surprises sit. All right, in this CML series that I've been working on, you can find those in my lab tools and lab exercise playlist at YouTube. Here's a list of some of the titles if you want to check those out. All right, let's jump in and talk about how CML stores data and how we can manipulate that. Let's just talk a bit about how CML stores things. So say you've got a Windows system and that's where you installed CML. So when you did that, you created this CML controller virtual machine and you gave it a disk. It's that disk that's used by the CML controller where your lab data is stored. So you could happily use CML for a long time. So you open up a web browser, you connect to the user interface of this controller, you create labs, you change them, you change device configurations, you learn for CCNA. And you do that for months and months and months, and all the lab data is stored on the disk of the CML controller VM. In fact, if that web browser is on a second computer over here, say it's also Windows, none of the lab data is stored on that computer's Windows disk or the CML controller's host Windows systems disk. It's in the disk created for use by the CML controller. But we can think about everything to do with one CML lab as being something that could be packaged up and shared. In fact, CML lets us do that. So think about it this way. There are things in CML about the lab that are inherent to the Cisco operating system, iOS, and there are things that are specific to CML. Things specific to CML are things like the topology. Where on the canvas did I put this router? Is it on the upper left, on the far right? Exactly what are the coordinates on this map? what interfaces are used, what cables are used. You can even add documentation and other things into the experience that just aren't part of the command line interface of network devices. Then of course, there are the device configs, good old running config and startup config that we're used to as networkers that are part of a lab. So you've got four devices, they've each got a running and startup config. So we want to have the ability to package that up and share it out of our system with others and then pull in the equivalent, say somebody's created a lab, you want to be able to pull that in and use it yourself. And that's where we're headed. But before we get there, we want to talk about how CML treats these two halves of what we consider one lab, because it treats them differently. Everything that's not part of the command line interface, like the topology and the interfaces and any notes you add to the user interface of a CML lab, it's automatically saved. There's no save button. There's not even an auto save every so many minutes. It's just saved. You change it, it's changed, all right? Whereas the device configs follow iOS rules. That is, if you get into config mode and you change the config and then stop the node, it's lost, all right? Just like it would be if you powered off a router or switch after changing the config but not saving it. So for our first demo, I'm gonna walk you through what happens with those two parts so you can see it really happen. I'll start this first demo by focusing on the iOS configuration on router R1 and R2. So I'm going to right click on R1 and get the console open and likewise on R2, open its console and resize a bit. And here's the drill. I'm going to change the host name on R1 and R2 to something that's easy to see. And then I'm going to stop and start both nodes. But I'm not going to save the config on R1, but I will save it on R2. So let me take a moment to do that, open these up. They just booted a little while ago, so let me get the uh, 
the right place, we get into privilege mode, config T to get into config mode, host name, Wendell, one, 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 one. Sorry for all the messages there. So I've changed the host name. Notice the prompt has changed. So the running config really has changed. If we get out of config mode, show run will show us that host name up near the top, right? And we'll do the same here on router R2. Open that console. So we've changed the host name here on router R2 to Wendell22222, etc. But copy run start. And now we've saved that, so our startup config also has that hostname command. So following iOS rules, if we were to power off and back on these devices, the R1 new config will be lost, R2 new config will not. So let's do that CML style with a stop, and then a start here on router R1. By the way, notice I click right now, and the top option is stop on R2. I click again, the top option is start because it's currently stopped. So now they're both starting up again. So here on R1, it's finished booting up or close to it. Notice the command prompt is back to that prior default. If we get into privilege mode and do a show run, we'll see the host name command reverted back to what it was before. Whereas on router R2, notice the prompt is the new host name and a show running config in privilege mode shows us that it remembered. All right, so that should be pretty straightforward if you know how those kind of things work in iOS. But then that config that's specific to CML, things like where things are up here in the canvas, right? We move the switch here and move this router around and we go look at the dashboard, well, this preview was already changed topology. If we open up the canvas again and we change the name of the lab and change it to a bunch of ones, well, that's saved for us. We could add lab description in some weird language there. <laughs> so that's saved, and there's no autosave. It's just automatically saved. It's inherent in the system that that's saved. So that's the two pieces that you keep in mind thinking about how CML operates. Now we're back to our CML user interface. We're using labs. Here's a lab that you'll see on your dashboard. We can think of it as one CML lab. We see the device configs when we're in the command line interface. But then we find out about some lab online that's free that you can download. All right, so now let's talk about how to do that. So you've got your CML user interface, but you've got another tab open on your browser that's looking at that lab, say it's at my blog site or others, you know, but you see some lab content and the lab says something like, hey, download the CML file. So that's where you can download a YAML file that that content creator had extracted from their copy of CML. And it's one file that holds the entire lab, both the CML specific parts and the device config parts. So your job here at this web page is just to click and the file downloads and it's stored on the disk of whatever computer you're using that web browser from. Now, it's not in the CML controller yet and that's where it needs to be for you to use it. So the next step then is from the CML user interface to click an option called import. So that word import is from the perspective of the controller telling the controller to import the file. And after you click import, it'll ask, well, what file do you want to import? And you drag and drop or identify the file name, and that will let CML import the file. Now, once CML imports the file, it will look inside the YAML file. It will see the detail about the topology, even the literal grid uh, marks on where to put the devices in the canvas and what interfaces to use and what cables to put in and what device configs to have. And then you can interact with it just like you would for any other lab. So let's do a demo and see just that. So for this demo, we're starting at the dashboard. We still have only one lab here, and all of its nodes are off, as you see here. 
Then we're going to click import to import the file. Now you can drag and drop the file, which I'm going to do. You could click in here and go through a process of searching your directory structure for the file. Pardon me while I go grab the file and pull it over. There it is. Now that I've done that, click import and it imported the file. Over here on the right, it looks like I can go to the lab. That would bring me to the canvas, but I'm instead just going to display the dashboard just to make sure you see now there are two labs visible. This one has a name of mostly Z's. That's a name I chose when I created the YAML file or edited it. I've got a description note in this one. Hey, it's used to demo some CML-free features for this lab series. If I click the lab, I see it here in the canvas. I can refit to make it a little bit more easily seen. None of the nodes are started. So as usual with any lab, I could go into lab and start the lab and bring things up. I can click and open the console for a device. I'll see it booting up. And what do you know? It's already booted up and it's ready to go. And I can say, look at IP addresses already pre-configured and we've got a few interfaces that are already in an up, up state with IP addresses configured as part of this lab exercise. So somebody supplied this lab file, the YAML file that we could import and start using to do something useful in lab. Pretty straightforward. So it's the download where the big surprise happens, right? So again, here's the controller and think of one lab as the CML specific parts, topology, devices and links, and then each network device has running and startup configs, right? one lab and we want to be able to download that and share it with others. So you might think there's a way to click something like a download that pulls one file holding all this information down to the disk of whatever computer you're using your web browser from. So then you can turn around and take that file and do something useful with it, like post it on some community or forum, or if you're wanting to make some labs and share with others, get a blog, put them up on the blog, whatever, like here at the Cisco Learning Network. Maybe you post it there and say, hey, I made this CML file. What do you think? You know, do the lab, that kind of thing. All right. The workflow, the idea is great. We just need to think about this extra step called extract because it's kind of surprising, in my opinion. So follow this sequence. Let's say you you have a couple of devices running in a CML lab and you're interacting with the controller's UI and you change the config of those devices. You get into config mode with configure terminal, you change whatever commands. You could even get out of config mode and do a copy running config startup config command that saves the running config to the startup config. And then you think, oh, I wanna download this one file that holds all that data to share with others. So I'm going to download the YAML file. I'm going to find that download option and click, and it downloads that YAML file. And guess what? Um, it, it does not include. It excludes that latest config you just added. And it's like, why is that? Well, it's a, it's a two-step process. There's this thing called extract you should have done in here before you downloaded the YAML file. So what's the extract about? Well, imagine you've got a lab running, say it's got three routers, those are all the network devices, so each one has a running and startup config. Before you download the YAML file, what you have to do is you click on extract. And with each device that's running, if you select it and say extract, it means extract their running configs and store them internally where we're going to grab data to make the YAML file. Now, it may not actually be in a YAML file. Cisco doesn't tell us about the internal data structure. But imagine there's a YAML file waiting to be downloaded. Well, there's this step that says extract our current running configs into that internal YAML file waiting to be shared. All right? So it's just a two-step instead of a one-step. So here's what I would recommend as the process Assuming your goal, which I think is probably what most people want to do, is the lab that exists in the CML controller that we're used to working with from the CML UI, its state, its config, is exactly what we want to share in our downloaded CML YAML file. That's typical, right? Why would we want them to diverge, right? We work with the lab. Let's download exactly that. So here's what you do. For that extract process to work, the devices have to be up and running. So make sure all your Cisco devices and lab are started. 
and then save all your device configs from the command line interface with a copy run start. That way we know that we're good on the CML controller side for when we stop the nodes and restart them, we won't lose any config. And then we do this extract function for all the network devices to extract their running configs to the internal CML YAML file, and then we download the file. Whew, seems like a lot, right? But it's not that bad. Let's do it in demo. So for this last and trickiest part of the demo, we've got the same dashboard, but now we've got a third lab added, Network Upskill Demo Lab 2. It's got the same topology, and I've already started it with four nodes, but I'm going to focus on router R1 up here. In fact, I'm going to start out by just selecting it so it highlights, and notice the widget area that comes up over here on the right, and there's a config tab. So let's take a moment and look at this. It's got what looks like the hostname command and a few details here about shutting down for interfaces, and that's all that's there. So what is this thing? This is the controller's current view of the device config. All right, so keep that in mind as we walk along here. So here's router R1, and if we open up the console and take a look at that, it's already started. It's got that default host name because of the configuration over there. And I'm going to add some configuration here. In fact, I've got some copied already onto the clipboard, so I'm just going to paste it in here. The specific configuration is not all that important, but a few interfaces got IP addresses. Four of them got no shutdowns to override the shutdowns that we had before. I'll control Z out. And if we do a show run, we'll see that host name is now R1. And if we go down to the interfaces, we'll see a few of them with IP addresses and the shutdown commands are removed from the first four interfaces. There we go. All right, so the config has changed here. Now we could even copy running config, startup config and save that. So what does that do? That just makes it so that if we stop the node and started it, or shut down the VM and restarted the VM, that then those network devices in the controller would come up with this new configuration saved. And, and that's a good thing. But if we go over here and deselect R1 and reselect it, and let's minimize this, notice this config over here in the widget still shows the same thing it did before. None of those new commands we just configured. So let's figure out how to do that extract thing. Now, all four nodes are started, and if we click on the nodes option, we see that we've got these selector boxes, and if you click at the top, you can select all. And if you select all and click extract, it tells us, hey, four of four remain, and it's doing some work. It's actually taking over the console and doing some CLI commands. And basically, it's doing a show run, copying the output from that and stuffing it in that internal area where the controller's view of the config is held. And it's finished, all right? So the extract is complete. Now, what's particularly interesting for us then is if we just select one node and get rid of this, look at what shows up over here in the config area. It looks like, you guessed it, the output of a show run command with this host name command with R1 in it, and further down here, we see some interfaces with those IP addresses that we saw. So indeed, it's like the extract just took the config, the running config from that device, stored it internally, and oh, by the way, you and I can see it with this little config area once we select the device there and see it there. Now, that's, that's the probably surprising part of the process. Now, if you want to download the lab, what will be downloaded is this controller view of the config that has just been updated with the extract process. So lab, download lab, and then you just download the lab and the file is downloaded. That part's easy. For those of you planning to use CML, hopefully this was a particularly useful and practical video for you. Hope you enjoyed it. As usual, click subscribe and the bell if you're new to the channel to be notified. And as always, likes really do help drive the algorithm. So give me a like and help me be successful. Thanks a bunch, y'all. Talk to you later.